Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the deep. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above it, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. The Sky World Woman. Back at the beginning of the world that we now know as Earth, it was nothing but water, while above it was a larger, more ancient world. Above it was the sky world. And a woman from the sky world was very curious, and she dug a hole in that sky world. She dug and dug until she dug all the way through it and fell into the hole and out the other side of it. And so it was that this sky woman came tumbling down toward the vast ocean of water that was the whole of our world at that time. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, and it was so. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth. Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, and it was so. Now, Living upon our ancient watery world were all manner of water animals, and the animals looked up to the heavens and saw the sky world woman tumbling toward them at an altogether alarming rate of speed. And so the geese and ducks and other water birds flew up to her, forming a net with their bodies and catching her as she fell, bringing her gently to the face of the waters where they placed her on the back of a giant sea turtle. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created male, then female, then God blessed them, and God said, be fruitful and multiply. Well, now the sky world woman and the water world animals had a problem because the sea turtle couldn't hold her up forever and the woman really didn't swim very well. One of the animals, many say it was the platypus, recalled that there might be a substance called mud deep below the surface of the waters and perhaps that could be brought up to create something upon which the woman could rest. And so, one by one, animals began trying to dive as deep as they could in search of mud. The pelicans tried, a walrus tried, and on and on, but each of them returned to the surface without having been able to go deep enough to bring up any mud. Finally, the otter said, I'll try, I'll try. It was gone for a very, very long time, and they were all afraid it might have drowned. But no, suddenly it popped to the surface of the water, a scoop of mud in its paw. The sky woman spread the mud on the back of the turtle and began to sing and dance upon it. And the animals sang and danced with her, and the mud began to spread and separate the waters until there was plenty of muddy land for the woman to live upon, as well as some of the animals who had decided to go with her. Now, you probably know the rest of the biblical Genesis story. God puts Adam and Eve into a gar great garden, a perfect world of beauty and bliss where all of their needs are met. He tells them there is only one rule. They may not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They do so anyway. Most tellers of this story blame the woman. God gets mad and thrusts them out of the garden and into a howling wilderness after which, after which much toiling, trouble, sinning, and suffering ensue. 
In our other story this morning, which I found through the work of two Native American writers and storytellers, Robin Wall Kimmerer and Thomas King, the Sky Woman gives birth to twins who work with the animals to mold the mud into mountains, valleys, and plains, and to cut rivers and streams through it. From seeds the woman had in her hand from all that digging she had been doing before she fell, they placed upon the land all of the plants and vegetation that the animals and early, early humans would need for food and shelter. Now, for those of you on this side of the sanctuary to whom I just told the Genesis creation story, what kind of themes and elements and issues come up in that story for you? There's a formality to it. It creates a hierarchical world. God, then humans, then animals and plants. Humans are given dominion over all other life. We have an omnipotent male God who speaks all of creation into existence in a solitary individual act. We have humans being given abundance and then because of their original sin and thus their fundamental depravity, being thrown into scarcity. The world is a competitive place. God versus the devil, humans versus the elements and each other. We have woman made second and blamed for the original sin. We have harmony being transformed into chaos. Now let's think about what sort of culture those of us with this creation mythology might form. One that's hierarchical, staid, individualistic, one that focuses on competition and scarcity. Perhaps it might become a culture that values power over others and thus could easily become warlike, could justify imperialism, colonization, slavery, racism, and other forms of oppression, a culture that is foundationally patriarchal and that sees the natural world as a resource to be exploited. And for those of you on this side of the sanctuary, some of the main themes of that Native American creation story I told you are quite different, aren't they? It's far less form formal, it's even playful, there is no omnipotent God. Instead, the animals and humans start with divine-like abilities. They work in cooperations. The humans and the animals bring the world into being, turning chaos into harmony. They exist communally and with far more balance and equity. No human dominion here. The original human is female, and the story has a maternal quality to it. With this as our creation myth, what sort of culture and society might we form? Might it not be very different? Now, I've oversimplified a bit. Still, the differences are stark. The power our stories have over us at a very fundamental level as individuals and as communities and societies is clear. We are storytelling creatures. We make sense of our experiences by folding them into a narrative that our brain is consistently constructing and reconstructing for us. And this, this is important to know because once we let a story loose in our world, we can never really take it back again. We can only change the telling of it or create a competing narrative. Now, of course, we shouldn't read these mythological stories as being literally, historically true. They're to be read as metaphor, as poetry and symbolic. Reading them as too literal is a mistake we often accuse fundamentalists of making. I think, though, that we too can do this in a reverse sort of way by also reading them too literally and then dismissing them without considering the poetic meaning and beauty that we might be able to find through them otherwise. Many of you are likely familiar with the Christian story of the virgin birth of Jesus, the divine son of God whom God sent to the earth only that he might die on the cross to wash our depravity clean with his very blood so that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish but rise again as he did after his crucifixion. Now I 
I personally can't take that story in a literal sense. And told the way it often gets told, it sometimes embodies values and ideas that I think can be harmful. Violence, human depravity, redemption only through the suffering and through the spilling of blood and death. There are other ways this mythological story can be told, though, with a poetry that I find much more agreeable. Here's an example. Once there was a spark of divinity that arose out of humanity's highest aspirations for living more fully, with more love, compassion, and joy, and that spark lured humans toward the more life-giving, life-fulfilling choices available to them in the creative possibilities of their universe. But the evils of avarice, jealousy, and tribalism obscured their ability to see those creative choices held before them. The powerful couldn't see past their dominance and greed. The poor and oppressed were prevented from reaching for their full potential Still, there was good in humans, and this found expression in the story of a child, a child who represented our highest human aspirations. The child grew into a wise leader, teaching others the healing power of love, drawing them toward compassion, calling them to give preference to the poor and oppressed until such circumstances would no longer exist. But some of the most powerful among them would not hear this call. They vowed never to allow such teachings to continue, and they killed this wise one to extinguish that spark of divinity. What they did not know is that human aspirations transcend any one person. They rise again and again, even up against the physical loss of one or more of us. What they could not know was that by killing one person, they only caused that spark to grow larger, carried forward in the hearts of those who wished to dwell in love and all that is life-giving. Same story told metaphorically and expressing a very different set of values. Not to mention far less blood and gore than the Mel Gibson film about it. <laughs> and I, I think it's important for us to reclaim and recast some of these ancient stories because they have been implanted into the very foundational structures of our society. Social and political science research has found that these myths are transmitted even into modern secular societies, where for even the non-religious, they are encultured through ethno-symbols, memories, values, rituals, and traditions embedded with the ongoing practices of a people. They are present even within the very language in which we think and speak. Some of you may have heard me talk about how when I was five years old, I told my mom I was going to be a minister when I grew up. But we were Southern Baptists, and when I found I couldn't fit within that religion, I created a story about what all religion was, and so thoroughly rejected the religious stories of my childhood that I left myself with absolutely no context within which to even consider ministry. It wasn't until many, many years later, after I found Unitarian Universalism, that I began to feel a calling toward ministry resurging. I described that calling to a rather sharp-tongued friend of mine as a really, really persistent voice inside of me. She said, well, tell the little voice to shut the hell up. <laughs> we both laughed. Later, though, I realized that telling the little voice to shut up was what the story I had created for myself about religion had been causing me to do for all of those years. I began to recreate my own story about religion as well as reframe the religious stories of my childhood so that I could finally fulfill the aspiration to which I felt beckoned. And I think that it is vital that we as a liberal religious faith 
reclaim and recast these stories, even though we may not share the beliefs in theology they have sometimes been used to express. They are a part of the very fabric of the culture and country in which we live. And currently, currently they are far too often being used to create a narrative that justifies vast wealth inequality, authoritarianism, violence, oppression, hyper-individualism, and the destruction of our planet. Certain folks are among the valued, chosen people and thus deserving of their wealth and power, while others are expendable or even to be debased. The New York Times recently ran an article about how a new public and political liberal religious voice is awakening after lying largely dormant for nearly 40 years. I believe that voice is sorely needed right now. It's been too quiet for too long to amplify our highest aspirations for greater peace, environmental stewardship, compassion, and communalism, we will have to be willing to reclaim our religious voices in the public square and recast the religious narrative that has taken hold. We have to be willing to use words like morality, like good, and like evil. And if we are to ever develop greater understanding and compassion with those whom we disagree, we have to also be able to hear and understand their stories and to articulate our own. The stories we tell and the ways in which we tell them define us as human beings. To change ourselves, our relationships, our communities, our nation, and our world for the better, we are going to have to reclaim and reframe some stories that have already been let loose into our world. From time to time, we will even have to create new ones. It may not be as hard as it might seem. Maybe... Maybe we dive into the deep, bring up a little mud, and begin the act of creation over and over again. May we sing and dance as we do so. Amen. <laughs>